Well, hello everyone. This is uh, Chris back again. Just uh, continuing <clears throat> along the lines of uh, the last discussion um, where I had talked about resistance and compliance and while I haven't done a in-depth quantitative assessment of the, those formulae, uh, we certainly should have a very intuitive and at least a qualitative understanding of what, the, what those, those various formulae are talking about and, and certainly uh, I've given you the tools that, that you need to start putting numbers in there and working through and crunching the numbers uh, and I'm not um, at this point um, in my studies I'm not um, convinced that a number is as necessarily as important as you know what the trend is is a number trending up and how does that apply to our patient clinically uh, as anyone knows I love formulae I love formulas I love the theory I absolutely love theory but we have to be able to take that and apply it to our patient clinically um, so certainly they're very important but we have to recognize you know what is the trend what is that number doing and, and ultimately, you know, how is it uh, being manifested in when we compare to our patient clinically? You know, for example, you know, is my patient on a ventilator? Is their static compliance decreasing? They're become, their lungs are becoming less, less compliant. Their chest x-ray shows, you know, bilateral diffuse patchy infiltrates um, with ground glass appearance and they've had some sort of traumatic insult and lots of fluid resuscitation. You know, the, the clinical presentation married with the number, you know, with that compliance decreasing, gives us a complete picture of, okay, this, you know, really is, at least at this point in time, pointing towards, you know, somebody with a specific condition. In this case, you know, there's more of a textbook definition of, of an ARDS patient. But again, it's very important that, that we realize that these numbers are just one, one little part of the picture and, and really the numbers are there to support what we appreciate clinically. Um, so I'm just going to continue moving on on the lines of talking about some of the, the, the respiratory formulae and I'm going to talk about types of flow today. And I think this is very important uh, because when we start recognizing that there that, that air or gas flows into our lungs and that there's some some method to the madness if you will of, of how gas flows in and out and when we interrupt the normal way that gas flows in and out of our lungs you know we do have problems if gas can't get in or out of our lungs effectively or the way it should you know what do we have well we have problems we have increased work of breathing we have ventilation problems, we have oxygenation problems, and so on and so forth. So let's just talk about types of flow. And really what I'm talking about with a flow, and I'm talking about a fluid. And if you remember from chemistry, basic chemistry even, we talked about the three major states of matter, and, and you could even throw in a fourth, plasma, but we're not going to talk about that. There are really three states. You have a solid, you have a liquid and you have a gas. And we knew or we remember that some of the defining characteristic, a defining characteristic of a, of a liquid is that when I take a liquid and I put it into the container, into some, some container, it can conform to the shape of that container. And that's very easy to do when I you know, pour, pour a drink into my glass, that, that fluid, that, that water, we'll say, conforms to the shape of the glass. Likewise, we know that if I take a gas, like oxygen, I can put that oxygen into a cylinder, compress it, and it, that gas, not the individual gas molecules or atoms, but the gas as a whole, will conform to the shape of the container. Well, we're going to take that concept just a little bit further and we can say that if something can conform to the shape of a container, let's say I have a pipe here, okay, and I have a, let's say a liquid, okay, <clears throat> and I take that liquid and I put that liquid in a pipe and I put a pressure here. 
uh, let's say 10 units of pressure here and out at the other end I'm gonna have a little lower pressure 5 units of pressure we'll say and because I have a gradient right I have a gradient of high to low and, and what do we know about diffusion all that in, in, in life in physical science well stuff is gonna go from high let's just say it's PSI PSI well we know that 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 liquid is going to flow through that pipe and this difference in pressure here this change if you will is known as the driving pressure and that makes sense if I have a lot of high pressure in my water faucet and I turn the water faucet on to the lower pressure in the environment outside, well, what way is that water going to flow? Well, there, I've created a gradient. There's a certain driving pressure, and the water is going to flow through that pipe. Well, one thing that we don't often appreciate is that a gas, if I were to put a gas into a pipe, could I flow a gas through a tube? Well, absolutely. If I put high pressure here on the straw, and there's lower pressure out of here, what do I know? about the, the flow of gas through here. Well, it's going to go from here to here. And I can easily appreciate that. And it is this ability for matter to flow, this ability for matter to flow, that is the defining characteristic of a fluid. And from this single concept comes a whole field of physics. Um, fluid mechanics or, or fluid dynamics and uh, certainly I'm not going to touch on a lot of that you know when you talk about the Navier Stokes formulas and, and formula and all that uh, it can get exceedingly complicated but I want to talk about how a fluid flows and in the case of the respiratory system really that fluid is going to be air it's going to be nitrogen oxygen a little bit of CO2 and then a few other gases but primarily we're talking about the nitrogen oxygen in the air that's flowing in and out of our lungs and there are different types of flow so the first type of flow is a nice orderly um, non-chaotic type of flow and we call that laminar flow okay laminar flow so if I have a pipe here or tube and I have a something that's flowing through it in a laminar type of way, what I'm going to get is it's going to flow in straight, pretty much straight parallel lines if you want to look at it that way. So I have gas flowing through here and what happens is gas toward the outside of the tube here, you know there's going to be a little bit of friction here, there's going to be some pressure. Um, it's actually, it's going to be flowing in a straight line just like this and because it is interacting with the wall of this tube it's not going to go as fast as the gas or the fluid toward the middle and hopefully that makes some intuitive um, sense so really in laminar flow what we can imagine is there are different sheets if you will different sheets flowing on top of one another like um, kind of like a, um, ice and if you remember you know like how ice if I have a block of ice I put another block on it um, they can kind of slip on top of each other and flow together and uh, that's kind of how this works so a little slower here and the gas or the fluid further away from the wall is going to flow a little faster a little faster yet and then even in the center it's going to be faster yet so I'm going to get something that looks kind of like this as it flows through but notice it's flowing in one direction, linear, no disruption, looks really nice. And actually this is, this is a good kind of flow because it doesn't take as much energy, as much driving pressure to, to make a fluid move through a pipe this way. Okay, so that's laminar flow. The second type of flow that I want to talk about is something called turbulent flow. And turbulent flow, as you would guess, 
is chaos. Turbulent is just chaos. So what happens here, are I get what are called vortices and eddies. If you kind of write a really fast slow, uh, flowing river or stream and you notice the water's crashing over the rocks and you have little whirlpools and eddies and all that, that is really analogous to turbulent flow. So when I have, say I have my fluid and it comes in and it's flowing really turbulent and these lines are now not straight and linear but they're going all over the place and then maybe even a little bit of twirling here and a little movement here and it's going up this way and down this way and in and out and all around it's just a mess now as you can imagine because it's so disorganized so random so chaotic uh, think of it as kind of like soldiers if anyone has been in the military and you have soldiers running all over the place and you're trying to get them to do something you know that it's just a chaotic mess. You know, I have three or four hundred people in a company and they're moving and running all over the place. It's a mess. And it takes a lot of energy. My driving pressure is going to be a lot higher here to, to, um, to drive this, this fluid through this pipe than up here. And what do I do in the military? Well, I you know, put everybody at attention, line them all up, and then as one unit, as one group, I march them on out to go where they need to, and that obviously is much more efficient. Okay, now the last type of flow is something called transitional. Um, there are actually uh, several names for this type of flow, but I'm just going to stick with transitional. You may see it uh, called some other names, but transitional is uh, kind of the name I'm going to go with, and I, I think it's the name that they talk about in a lot of the respiratory book, the, the Egan's book, and. and and whatnot. And, and really what that is, is that is somewhere between laminar and turbulent, where I have basically a mixture. I have kind of a general laminar, kind of a flow pattern like this, but it's just, I still have, you know, it's not perfectly laminar, but it's not perfectly turbulent. And obviously I can have um, varying degrees of transitional airflow. And actually transitional airflow is very important in respiratory therapy because most of the flow in our respiratory tract is going to be more toward this transitional because I have lots of branching and bifurcations. But anyway, these are the three types of flow. Uh, in the next video I'm going to talk about how do we identify flow, how do we even figure this out, and this is some crazy stuff. I think you guys will like it, I certainly like it. It's a, it's a calculation that results in a dimensionless number. And if you don't know what that is, don't worry. We'll talk about it next time. Thank you, guys.